Welcome to Brainish English Stories. A group of small boys stood on the corner, looking down the shaded street. They were from eight to twelve years old. They had dirty hands and dirty clothes. Some were poor, and some were very poor. They were different races, but all were impatient as they watched the sidewalk. Many people walked by. But they were looking for someone special. Gee, what's taking her so long? Maybe she went the other way. No way. She knows we are waiting. The tallest and the most ragged boy pulled out a nickel watch from his baggy shirt and tight pants. It's not so late. He said, showing the watch. It's twenty to one, and I set my watch by the city hall clock at noon. She's not so late. What do you think she has? Sour balls or peanuts? Asked the smallest boy. Maybe pennies, said a young boy who was saving up for a trip. Get out. She doesn't give us money unless she had no time to buy something," said another boy. She told us she doesn't give money presents unless she had no time. I bet she has something," said a round little black boy. We should be getting downtown. She's usually here by now, and we need to get our afternoon papers. Oh, be quiet, Cooney. It's not even two yet. There she is. The last boy shouted and pointed down the street. He jumped up and down, his bare feet hitting the pavement. The other boys shouted and waved their arms like in an Indian war dance. The person they were waiting for was a young girl, tall for her age. She wore a straight short skirt and a loose jacket. Her clothes were light brown. Her hands were in her jacket pockets. She wore a sailor hat pushed back on her head. Her bright red hair curled around her face like a playful halo. She walked with a happy and businesslike stride. Her face was not pretty, but it was full of charm, and her skin was perfect. She smiled as she saw the shabby boys waiting for her. Her smile showed strong white teeth between full red lips. She waved at the boys, and they waved back at her. Gosh, her hair is so red," said one boy, amazed by her hair shining in the sun. "It's not red." "Shut up." "Sure, it's red." "What is it then?" asked another boy, teasing. "It's it's hair," said the boy, defending her, not knowing how to describe it. Yes, red hair. Very red hair," said the boy proudly, not to insult her, but to state a fact. "Red hair yourself. Your mother has red hair." This was just a guess because they didn't know each other's families. She doesn't. It's black. The little Italian boy hit his opponent hard on the mouth, and they started to wrestle like two puppies. The girl started running towards the boys. Her red hair glowed brightly, but she didn't come like an angry angel. She was smiling, and her eyes were laughing too. She grabbed the shoulders of the two fighting boys and pulled them apart. "Hey, you little rascals! What's wrong with you?" 
Stop fighting, she said in a clear, young voice. Tony Caprioli, calm down. Mike McGinty, what's your problem? You're breaking the law. Stop fighting, you troublemakers. He said you had red hair. I said you didn't, muttered Tony, still angry. He hit me first. I didn't mean anything bad. It just looked red, said Mike, changing his story a bit. The girl laughed and her red hair sparkled. Tony, your last name means goat, Caprioli, and you are acting like one. It's okay, my dear, even though you are trying to say my hair isn't red. But Mike is right. My hair is red, very red, and I like it. Shake hands, boys, and stop fighting. My red hair gives me energy, and energy helps me move fast, especially when I'm late, and buy toffee squares for everyone. So it's okay, Tony, thanks for standing up for me. Catch, boys. I bought a box, two boxes, three squares each, and good luck to you all. Hurry up. It's almost one o'clock, and I have to run or the girl I replace will be mad. The bad feelings went away like magic with the girl's happy laughter. She quickly gave out sticky toffee squares to the boys and licked her fingers when the last square was gone. That's enough, she cried. Suck it, don't chew it. You won't get more toffee until cool weather comes. I was silly to buy something so messy. Next time, I'll buy something neat like balls or peanuts until September. Goodbye, boys. I have to hurry. I hope you sell all your newspapers. Goodbye. She waved to the group of boys, and they waved back and shouted, Goodbye, even though their mouths were full of toffee. The girl hurried away, walking very fast. The boys went around the corner towards the newspaper offices, and the funny little daily event was over for now. The red-haired girl had become friends with this group of boys, and she liked to bring them a small joy every day. She gave them different gifts, but she never forgot them. The boys loved her and believed in her kindness. She knew that her actions made them feel that people could be trustworthy and kind. Only the girl and the boys knew about this funny charity, as she called it. It only took a few minutes of her time and not much money. It was worth it, she told herself, to let her red hair brighten the boy's noon hour. The girl walked quickly into a tall building, her hands out of her pockets, her arms swinging to move faster. She wasn't out of breath but softly whistled silver threads among the gold. She thought about how different the song's words were from her bright red hair. She got out of the elevator and into the big room of the telephone exchange almost in one smooth move. Oh, Sis Adair. I was starting to wonder if you'd ever show up, exclaimed a small, fancy-looking young person sharply, as the girl with red hair arrived, taking off her hat and jacket quickly and hanging them up. She smiled at the small person she had replaced. Of course I'm here, Amelia. I always make it, whether it's for work or fun. 
I'm only five minutes late, anyway, said the newcomer, adjusting her ears. Five minutes matters when you have to go home, eat, and get dressed. I have plans, you know, Miss Sicily, replied Amelia. Lucky you. I never have time for plans, can't even get a date, not ever, sighed Sicily with a sad shake of her head and a wink at the girl beside her. Sorry, Amelia. I'll come five minutes early tomorrow, so get another plan ready. And you might get there sooner if you start now that I'm here, instead of waiting to scold me. The other girls laughed, and Amelia walked off with a toss of her head. Everyone in the office knew that there was no use trying to outsmart Sissa Dare. Most of the girls liked her, and a few admired her a lot. It was only Amelia who ever wanted to hurt her cheerful confidence in herself and the world. Funny little Amelia. Sis said after Amelia left. She seems to argue with herself so much and can't stay out of her own way. Oh, Sis, whispered Nan Dowling, Sis's co-worker. You say such funny things, and sometimes very true ones. That's Amelia all over. She does argue with herself. A little sour bowl. We agreed not to bother about her, hinted Sis. I don't have to, as long as I work after her. I hardly see her. No, but I do. I work with her from nine to one, except during lunch, right after you. Why aren't you working all through my shift, you wonderful old duck? Sis, cried Nan. I don't have answers to whys, Nan, nothing's harder, said Sis cheerfully. Be glad you get to work with me from one to six. And that we don't get many calls on our phones until after three, so we can chat. Amelia is really jealous of you, Sis, and you know why, said Nan. She'd love to cause trouble for you, if she could. If she could, she's welcome to try, said Sis calmly. Anyone who lets someone grab their head to lift it deserves what they get. Amelia can't hurt me as long as I do my work and mind my own business. If you mean she's still upset because Harold Brown thought he liked me, Sis shrugged her shoulders. Nonsense, she added. Nan laughed, but she looked worried. Still, Amelia would love to cause trouble for you, Sis, she said. Of course, you don't care what Harold Brown does. Care. Ever seen a chestnut worm? Sis interrupted. Both girls burst into laughter, trying to keep it down not to disturb others. Harold Brown was big, chubby, puffy, and very pale. Sis's question didn't need an answer. Oh, Sis, sighed Nan, as she often did, amazed and delighted by Sicily's cheerful nature. You're something else. Nan got a call then, but when she finished and was free, she turned to Sis. It's not just Harold Brown, Sis. You don't seem to care about any of them, she said. Meaning boys and men, asked Sis. You're wrong, Nan. I like them all. Yes, but not in the same way they like you. You're like a friendly boy, but you don't, and lots of them really like you. 
You make them feel crazy about you, sis, with your playful but distant way and your kind of attractive charm," said Nan. "Oh, come on," protested sis. "You don't know much about charm, Nan. You got that from a book. Admit it." The price of champagne and the fancy description in novels show that's just made up. Stick to facts, Nan. Me, charming. I don't think so. After a few calls, Cicely turned to Nan again. That was a coincidence, a funny coincidence, she said. The first call was for Miss Lucas from Parkway Fifty Eight, and we know who that is, right, Nan? Of course, Miss Lucas said. Nan, we always forget there are other Lucases, like her father, mother, sister, and a few boys. But it was for Miss Lucas, and it was her fiance calling. I always recognize his voice. Honestly, I don't really like it. It's sweet but not quite right, like maple syrup before it's ready. At our house, the syrup always goes bad before we finish it. I don't know how often Miss Spencer serves it like that. It's disappointing when you pour it on pancakes. Anyway. About Mr. Herbert Dale's voice. I'm very particular about voices. I think they show more about a person than anything else, and I don't like his voice on the phone. I hope I'm wrong, because Miss Jeanette Lucas is a nice girl. I met her once, though she probably doesn't remember. She's a gentle, sweet. An old-fashioned girl, and I bet she loves her man very much. That's the way to love the person you marry," said Nan romantically. "It's a good idea, but it's risky because most men are quite human," Sis remarked dryly. "Don't be silly. If you ever fall in love, you'll give your whole heart to him," cried Nan. Sure. Keep it down, Nan. That's not something to tell everyone. And no, I won't," whispered Cicely. Then, changing her tone, she said with a bit of passion, "Well, what's the point of loving any other way? Not much fun if you treat it like a disease," said Nan. Where was the coincidence in Mr. Dale calling Miss Lucas, sis? It wasn't a coincidence. But it was weird that the rest of my calls were Miss Lucas calling old boy store, a dressmaker, a jeweler, and a garage. Explained sis. She does that every day. Now that she's getting ready to marry, whispered Nan. Disappointed. Yeah, that's true," agreed Sis. I noticed how he calls. He says the number so oddly. I'd like to get fifty-eight, the Parkway, if you please. Sis imitated his smooth voice, and Nan laughed. That's him," she said. "You're good at imitating." Sis. Last Sunday's paper said Miss Lucas and Mr. Herbert Dale will marry next month in our church. Is Mr. Dale Catholic? I don't really know," said Sis. His family is. The Lucases are strict. I think Jeanette will make sure he follows the rules. She probably wants him to become a saint in no time. But I really don't like his voice. You're acting strange, sis. 
You usually give everyone the benefit of the doubt, said Nan, puzzled. Then she whispered, Did you go to Mass yesterday, sis? Sis shook her head, looking uncomfortable. I didn't go. I wasn't at the usual eight o'clock mass either, she admitted. Oh, sis. Nan sounded hurt. You're usually so good. Why not go? You're Catholic, she sighed. I know, Nan, said sis, trying to laugh it off. I was just tired. I stayed out late, danced, and had a big dinner. I meant to go, but I was too tired to get up. Sis, oh, sis. You're such a good person. Why not make it perfect, sighed Nan, looking concerned. I'm not really bothered by all this distant stuff. Sorry, Nan. I'll try to do better and go to Mass on Sundays. But when I do go, it's hot and crowded, and I'm just physically there, not mentally. It's uncomfortable. Does it even matter if you go if you're not really present? Sorry again, Nan, said Sis, seeing Nan's sad expression. I didn't have your upbringing. I went to public school and my mom died when I was eight. My dad wasn't around much either. So I guess I'm a mix of Catholic and non-religious. Sorry, Nan. You're a great person, and I'm sure God will bring you closer to him. You're too amazing to miss out on the greatest, said Nan earnestly, despite her quiet voice, her eyes shining with sincerity, which impressed Cicely. Light a candle next to Miss Jeanette Lucas, she said, knowing Nan would pray for her. You two have talked enough for today, said another girl nearby. We want to talk to Sis too, Nan. We won't have much more time to chat, said Sis. It's getting busy in the afternoon. It was a busy day at the Uptown Exchange. Nan finished at five but waited to have supper with Sis, who worked until ten. After supper, Sis returned to work while Nan headed home. I hate to leave you, Sis, but nothing ever happens to you, said Nan. You wouldn't be much help, Nan, laughed Sis. I'll be done by ten, and it's safe enough. No one would dare bother a redhead like me. I'm like a warning sign.